Hi there, History 300 folk. It's Marcus Dan. All right, well, here we are. It's We're heading into week four next week. And so I'm going to give a little bit of a, a take on some of the readings. I'm going to touch on Barbara Tuckman's enjoyable read. Her book's fantastic, by the way. I've had it for about well, 30 years or, or something. Um, but, you know, that aside, then we've got, you know, the theses on history and theory or theory and history. And uh, we've also, I'm going to touch a little bit on the Mina Salami on blackness as well. But I'm going to fit it into this question that, you know, we're wrestling with along the way on objectivity. So just let me share my screen and we can start. All right. So. As always, I'm pitching this as a thought bubble. Thought bubbles are important uh, in a thinker's life, in a thinking world. And of course, it's a world that's not particularly thinking most of the time. Most of us and most of our peers and most of society seem to be caught in very routine little cycles. And I think this is part of the pro product and objective of education, for that matter. So that's me being a little bit cynical. So let's let's uh, see what thinking we can get up to. First of all, I want to talk about narrative, which is sort of like the key question for this week. You know, in many respects, much of what we've covered so far in this course has hinged on the role of narrative, the historical imagination. Uh, fictio and the tensions between con continuity and discontinuity. We're not going to leave these things behind as we move into the second part of this course or the next part of this course. But, you know, it's important to actually say something summative, I guess. In history, we take narrative for granted. That's my summative statement. It is part of the craft. It's a part of what a good historian does. We all like picking up a good book, I've got this one. let's say here's a great book, The Work of the Dead, okay? And it's a cultural history of mortal remains. It's the sort of thing that probably Tony will get his nose into as he researches his uh, uh, his own PhD. It's fantastic, and particularly the the opening uh, sections there and you know, the early chapters lay out very nicely the project. But the guy can tell a great story. He has a great capacity to tie things together, to say, look, and this is what he actually says, I really was interested in the uh, history of human attitudes to death. It didn't lead him anywhere. He's been, he'd been working on this for 20 or 30 years, but he finally uh, landed on the social use of cemeteries, places for the dead, memorialization, and so on, and the role that the dead played in the lives of the living, of course. I mean, the dead, the dead, right? They're not going, they've got no role for themselves. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, a famous Greek orator like Plato or Socrates, or whether you're just the serf or peasant that was tilling the fields of some barren lord in, in France or China, you know, um, it doesn't matter, you're dead. I mean, that's that's the basic premises there. So the narrative of the individual is lifted out of that particular context in which that human lived, that person lived, and becomes something part of what historians do. We tell stories about changes in social values. We tell stories about battles and wars and great leaders you know, and generally we don't care about the people who are invisible, but, you know, those great leaders all had, you know, servants, supporters, wives, husbands, whoever it is. Sorry about that. People always seem to wait for me to start recording a lecture or whatever this thing's supposed to be, and then they start sending me messages. And if I cut that off, I cut this off on that last week. So, because I'm uh, hotspotting off my phone. So narrative is part of the historian's craft, absolutely. And, you know, we all love and we have our favourite historians, nearly all of them, whom are great uh, at writing beautiful prose. Narrative is implicitly theoretical, however, and that's something that Kleinberg and his colleagues 
in the theses on theory and history want to make explicit, okay? So narrative is implicitly theoretical because narrative is a coherent story of something. It's giving meaning, finding reasons for all the things that theory does. But, you know, to be good historians, you might say, or good researchers, or effective historians and researchers, we need to make this explicit. If we think about Richard Evans' work on David Irving, we can see that Richard Evans has an assumption, a theoretical premise on how history or good history or quality history is created. David Irving rejects the basic theoretical assumptions of the historian's work. He rejects it outright, but he is unaware of his own theoretical positioning that for him, primary sources are the only valid sources, that, you know, history almost takes place in a vacuum. He's theoretically blind. Evans is, I think, theoretically sophisticated, but he's not, because he's writing a book for the general public, he's not going to belabor theory. He's going to talk more about method. And, of course, he talks about method to demonstrate that David Irving's method is faulty, you know, that the issues around his ability to write uh, impartial, um, you could say objective history on the Nazis, Second World War, and so on, is flawed. That's where he goes with that. And he uses method, which, of course, cops a wallop, as I'm going to point out, from Kleinberg and Co. But there is a context for Kleinberg and Co.'s um, complaints, and we'll come to that. So <clears throat> my last point here is that the making of narrative and theory explicit strengthens claims to objectivity. The more explicit our theoretical assumptions about the way history works or the way the world works and history works, you know, the, the more likely we are to approach some form of objectivity. Even it's saying that we're subjectively embedded in the in the quest for objectivity, you might say. It's an exploration of, therefore, of how do we make knowledge, which in philosophical terms is the epistemological. So how do we make knowledge is key to the way this course is being run, actually. It's saying, okay, what aspects of historical knowledge can we describe in this way or that way? In other words, we've got to question the historical or the, should I say, better say, the historian's work in crafting what we would call quality history, history that approaches some degree of truthfulness so that we are not willy-nilly putting words or, you know, describing experiences of those who no longer, and this is in a Clinton, can describe them themselves, that we are ethically involved in generating an understanding of an historical event, be it as horrid as the Holocaust, you know, or as grand as the cathedral building of medieval Europe or whatever it might be, that we can actually do justice to that by providing um, not only whatever evidence and weaving it together, providing it with some level of coherence so that meaning can emerge. Meaning can also emerge from incoherence, by the way, but incoherence is simply, and this is where Barbara Tuckman goes, acknowledging that there are so many holes in our uh, ability to access the past. So let's turn to Tuckman now. <coughs> I love the Middle Ages. My undergraduate degree uh, many years ago was very much focused on the medieval, the European, and so on, which explains why I've had Barbara Tuckman's book for so long, hey? So anyway. Let's have a look at this. I hope you enjoyed the reading. Tuckman was uh, at, at the second reading for last week. But as you can tell, I, I need to move backwards and forwards, trying to sew or weave, um, I guess, coherence uh, into this course. Tuckman makes this very important point in her introduction. She says it may be taken as axiomatic that any statement of fact about the Mid Middle Ages may and probably will be met by a statement of the opposite or a different version. Contradictions, however, are part of life. 
I like that. I, yeah, par- life is a very paradoxical thing, in my opinion. But contradictions, however, are a part of life, not merely a matter of conflicting evidence. I would ask the reader to expect contradictions, not uniformity. And her book's about that thick and it's, and it's a solid tone. Really good read, too. She writes beautifully. So no aspect of society, no habit, custom, movement, development is without cross-currents, in other words, without contradictions or paradox. So this is as true of the last 30 or 40 years as it is of the last three or four, five, six, seven centuries. And of course, the further you go back, um, the more difficult it gets, it, it becomes also, the more difficult it is to access uh, the kind of evidence that we require to, you know, weave things together. But there's still enough evidence and there's still enough of a... Um, a footprint met from these previous periods, whether they're periods in the European sort of footprint, whether they're periods in Central and South America, North American and Indigenous American civilizations of one kind or another, whether we're talking China, India, uh, Mesopotamia, Africa, and uh, Sub Saharan and, and particularly Africa, you know, there there is enough evidence now enough material evidence uh, of different kinds to enable historians to do something useful or say something meaningful about the pasts in those contexts but there are there's always going to be very large areas where as she says the statement about of fact about that period may be met by, met by a statement of the opposite and i think we need to be able to hold opposites in our head emotionally hold them not need to always come up with a definitive answer this is the truth no this is an approximation to the truth historical objectivity in my opinion is not the ability to stand outside of the historical world and say this happened and this happened and this happened because of this it's more to to step into the world as tuckman is really arguing for us to do particularly when she talks about empathy uh and you know to enter that world via a historical imagination and it comes back to what good old um um Griffiths talks about when he talks about the ability to time travel can we using the historical imagination a good deal of dose of discipline you could say we can't make things up how can we enter other two periods of time so let's see what Tuckman says look she says there are a bunch of problems and she lists them off there are contradictions in the evidence itself which she's already pointed to there are the biases of the various of us historians some historians are really great passionate nationalists so they'll write a history in which the French look better than the English or the Spanish or the Germans or whoever it might be so there are biases biases were unconscious because in the past, history was often written in order to bolster some regime of some kind. There are also biases in the record. There's sometimes no information. You know, uh, I'm saying within the medieval, because that's where Tuckman situated. Monks wrote about, you know, the, the terrible bloodthirsty Vikings coming through and smashing people. They didn't talk about the the fact that for decades and generations sometimes you know people here there or anywhere uh were living just normal lives why because of course it doesn't make the news and as she says here there's exaggeration in history this is exactly the same as in the daily newspaper the normal does not make the news okay that's important to understand so you know and then she says, and another problem is empathy. The fact that the medieval society, though it's European, and uh, we are uh, from a, an historical perspective, the current inheritors of the European tradition, that medieval period of 700 years ago is basically like a different world, a different culture completely in many, many respects. So she she lays these things out very nicely sequentially for us, and she gives us Tuckman's Law, which is the fact of being reported in medieval chronicles or whatever, multiplies the apparent extent of any deplorable development 
by five to tenfold. At least, she said, I, I just sort of took that little bit of her Tuckman law. She had a bracketed area, a parentheses area, where she says, you know, and, and you know, that it, this is at least by five or tenfold. So here we have a great medieval image from Peter Bruegel, um, in which you've got war and death and skeletons. And, you know, it's definitely not a nice image. But if you think that that was the entirety of the medieval imaginary and the medieval experience, we'd be wrong, okay? Um, there were periods in which, you know, many villages and many people lived lives of, you know, quiet industry, you could say. So if you think about it, bad news, the horrors of war and so on, make for great narratives, great stories. Uh, certainly a, a historical novelist like Bernard Cornwall would not write about the, the Napoleonic Wars with his sharp novels or, you know, the wars of uh, the Hundred Years' War and so on, uh, or the Anglo-Saxon slash Viking, you know, times of Alfred the Great. Um, he, he chooses, I think that a dramatic, you know, and, you know, they go from one, you know, uh, hostile engagement to another type thing. But for most people, much of the time was relatively stable. Relatively. I mean, I'm thinking I've got a whole bunch of sort of little screaming things going on in my head, but I, I think I'll leave it at that. So narrative and meaning step forth into any engagement with the past, okay? Not so much for continuity's sake as to offer interpretive insights. I see narrative as an interpretive tool, uh, a way of tying various elements together, but not a tool that, as Clint Denon is very, uh, you know, she stresses very much that this narrative is disciplined by historians' uh, code of ethics, you could say, by the evidence and so on. Elton says similar things and so does uh, Lukacs. So here's a picture of St. Francis of Assisi. Tuckman observes towards the end of her little introduction that man, and she's writing in 1978, so she's using that, that uh, gendered language, man himself was the formulator of the impossible Christian ideal. That's, and I put in, in square parentheses there, chivalry and renunciation, and tried to hold it. It was an aspirational thing, if not lived by it for more than a millennium. Therefore, it must represent a need. And this is really important to get inside the psychology of a period. A need, something more fundamental than uh, Gibbons, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 18th century Enlightenment allowed for, or his elegant ironies could dispose of. Gibbon was always making fun of the fact that during the, um, the medieval period that, you know, uh, people were killing one another or having sex or whatever it might be, uh, despite the fact that they were had these ideals of chivalry and renunciation. So she concludes, while I recognise its presence, it requires a more religious bent of mind. So she's saying, I can't handle this. I can do with that secular stuff over there. But I don't herself, she's owning up to the fact that she doesn't have a religious or spiritual temperament. Um, she's a secular historian writing a secular history. She's going to leave writing a history of St. Francis and his effect or impact on 13th century because he was a century before her century that she writes about. You know, that St. Francis had a role. What was it that attracted people to him? What was the needs that he was trying to meet? What were the shifts happening in Christianity that were theological as well as cultural? These things Barbara Tuckman is going to leave somebody else. She's going to focus on a secular period in, in, in her choice of subject matter and so on. She's not going to try and deal with stuff that she feels is beyond her knowledge and worldly experience. I think that's really important. I think it's really important to own up to what you are going to do and what you're not going to do. So, cheers to that. Now, before 
and I do this every year in one way or another, before we leap into Kleinberg's and Co's theses on history and theory, I want to um, point out that theses or writing of theses is not something new. It's something that has a history itself. So the theses in history have a history, particularly, and these two are, are well worth checking out, uh, the Karl Marx one is a live link. It's uh, his thesis on Feuerbach, which he wrote in the same year that he wrote the Communist Manifesto. And then almost a century later, in the 1930s, Walter Benjamin wrote Theses on Philosophy of History, okay, from which you get his famous uh, Theses 9 on the famous Angel of History images there. Um, I'm assuming that you all no, <laughs> I shouldn't assume anything, should I? That Karl Marx wrote his thesis on Grubach and the Communist Manifesto in 1848. I should say that. So there's, you know, Benjamin was writing 90 years later type thing. But I just want to point that out. Now, you'll find in the extended readings the thesis, a copy of the thesis on the philosophy of history, which I scanned years ago and has been available for a long time. It's well worth looking at. It's well worth looking at the thesis on Feuerbach as well, because you can see the developmental arc between 1848, 1930s, and the, uh, when was it, uh, 2016, 2018, wherever it was, 18, 2018, I think, from memory, that uh, Einberg and Co. developed their History Revolt uh, web page, put up that manifesto of, of theses, and so on. So I'm going to explore those theses now just a bit, okay? So the Theses on Theory and History, it's a crit critique of historical ontological realism. In other words, and it, this is where I've, uh, I've got to contextualize it. They are writing in the American historical context. They are particularly cheesed off at the American Historical um, Society's Journal, okay, which acts as a gatekeeper in many respects to the... Um, to the to those historians who are conforming to the historical realist approach. In other words, I'm just writing history. You don't need to theorize it. Oh, but you do need to go to the archive and do this kind of stuff. So the methodological stuff is there. They they're particularly at pains to challenge the method methodology without theory dimension. This is an area that Richard Evans doesn't really touch on. It's implicit in his work. And why? Because, as I said just a few moments ago, uh, Evans was um, writing a popular account of his work. He didn't feel the need to theorise, but I also don't see him as a as an historical theorist per se. <clears throat> he use, He's quite happy to use methodology, but you can see that uh, his methodolo methodological approach is informed by a form of ontological realism, I would say. That's implicit. So that's the Anglo on the other side of the uh, Atlantic, um, weaving itself into uh, the North American historical approach particularly. What is it that these guys are doing? They're, they're arguing for a critique, a critical theoretical approach, and they make it very explicit in the uh, in the sections that they've devised for their for their work. Okay, so they from the early on in the theses, they make this point: the current obsession with methodology is premised on that you know historians just work when they're building you know a narrative, the odos, which is Greek for path or, or you know trajectory, to historical knowledge is assumed to be singular. Okay, ontological realism is not good at handling the plural or alternatives or paradox. Uh, so you would have to say that Barbara Tuckman is not a, a realist in that sense. Thesis 1.7 develops that. She says, given that historians analyze the dynamic and changing character of social formations, relations, experiences, and meanings, they cannot do without a solid grasp of critical theory. And they, they, they don't care what kind of critical theory. We're going to end up talking about post-colonial critical theory and feminist critical theory in, the, in this little thought bubble. It could be semiotic, psychoanalytic, Marxist, hermeneutic, 
phenomenological, structuralist, post-structuralist, feminist, post-colonial, queer, etc. I mean, they don't care <clears throat> just so long as the historian doing their work has a grasp of the critical theoretical uh, world. Okay, and they also need, they argue that uh, they need an understanding of the history of historical knowledge and the theory of history, kind of like what we're doing in this course. Okay, you need to be able to go out, not necessarily as, you know, mad historical theorists, but you need to know that whatever your research is, however it's done, it's informed by either implicit or explicit theoretic, theoretical positions. I think that's really important. And then they talk about, and this is obviously very useful for you guys who are writing your uh, assessment piece, objectivity, that it's contextual. Critical history recognizes that all facts has always already mediated. They're not, they're not in a vacuum. They're not clean, you can say. They're categories as social and con and concepts as historical. So I'll say that again because they didn't read it particularly well. History recognizes all facts as always already mediated. Categories are social categories and concepts are historical. Theory is worldly. And concepts do worldly work. In other words, the theoretical is not just abstract. It actually informs how we work, how we tell our stories, how we analyze, how we assess, uh, and so on. That this is what I was on about when I was saying that David Irving doesn't, he lives in an atheoretical world where he even rejects methodology. Uh, he won't engage with other historians thinking on a subject that he's writing about. Um, he doesn't even consider that that's a valid thing to do. All right. So this is this is a very interesting one. So objectivity itself is contextual. There's nothing clean about being objective. Objectivity is an attempt. It's aspirational. It's an attempt to stay true to the evidence, to whatever the facts are, and at the same time to understand or appreciate that our own um, position in as narrator, as historian, as researcher, is always going to be mediated. It's going to be social, and it's going to be informed by historic the historical. They conclude their uh, short little set of theses with this beautiful passage, okay? I've just taken a section out of it, but it's on the navel of the dream. They're using metaphor. They, they're developing what you might call an historical aesthetic, you know, a, a way of a, a drawing people in through imagery. If we think, they say, of the historian as akin to the interpreter of dreams, which is an interesting thing. So the past and the present are dreamlike. I'm thinking of the Sandman from Netflix. <laughs> so we see that those who look to make literal sense of the dream by presenting it in a chronological, realist, and self evident manner are recognized and rewarded. But that's not what they want to do. But those whose inquiries lead to the obscure navel of the dream, what's the source of the, um, of the, uh, the theoretical source, what's the worldview, what are the assumptions, what the, are the paradigmatic assumptions about the way the world works? That's what they mean by the navel. The place where narratives and interpretations stop making conventional sense are ignored or dismissed. Why? Because for most historians who are realists, this stuff is bullshit, basically. <laughs> I'm, I'm being a bit frank there. Hang on a second, I better have a cup of tea and um, breathe out. So for me, and I've used this um, since I since it came out actually, because of very very quickly in 2018, I've been using their theses in this course as a way of, of introducing um, historians critiquing an approach to history in a very explicit manner. The realist approach to history or in history is flawed. They're arguing, and I'm going to flick back to the previous slide, that you you can't do clean history. You can't be objective. You can't be realist. 
in the way that historical realists aspire. Why? Because things are mediated, things are social, and things are historical. Let's move on to this gorgeous young woman, Mina Salami, on blackness. Now, she's, I really like the way she writes. I like the accessibility of, of her work. Um, but what is interesting about her, her work for me is that she uses narrative beautifully to tell her story, but also narrative as a lens for the theoretical. So this is why I, I note here. <clears throat> so she weaves feminist and post-colonial theory with the personal, her story. In a sense, it's embodied or phenomenological, which is where we're going to end uh, in this thought bubble. So finding, she finds, and we find through her, in narrative theory, and in theory, we find narrative. They're flowing backwards and forwards like so. Why? Because theory is, in fact, I think, a narrative device. All right? It, it's a way of making intelligible the world around us. The problem is, and this is something that she doesn't do, but the problem is that some people think the world is made intelligible through only one theory. I'm, you know, the, the uh, Kleinberg and Co., you know, they there are a number of different orientations there. You know, Kleinberg is very much a critical Marxist-type theorist. Um, the woman who writes with him, I'm trying to think of her name, we uh, we have as an extra reading, one of hers on feminist uh, reading, uh, Scott, that's her surname. Yeah, no, so Scott's a feminist. So they come together from different allegiances you might say but i think you can be overly wedded to any particular specific orientation what i like about mina salami's work is that she slides across and between various theoretical positions according to the need of her narrative and i think that's really important to remember and i think all the best historians and this is me now, this is my opinion, it might not be yours, uh, are people who do the same, okay? So my question is of you, how is the second reading doing this? And is, in the worldview of Mina Salami, is she black? What does she mean by black? And I think it's really interesting, her handling of this idea starts off being embodied but ends up being a political slash social slash theoretical position that makes explicit certain relationships and certain deficits of relationship too. So she uh, she makes the following point. The need to affirm one's blackness manifests uniquely from individual to individual and group to group. In other words, you can't say there's just this black cutout we're all white, they're all black. And black people have experienced this, slavery, trauma, whatever it might be. But oppression and defiance and protests against white supremacy are today seen as tantamount to blackness. So she's saying many are essentializing blackness. And, and essentializing means seeing it through one lens. In a sense, it's a bit like historical realists. One is not born, but one becomes black. In other words, she's extrapolating from the great feminist, early 20th century feminist, Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. In other words, the socialization, uh, nature and nurture type tensions there. You might be biologically female, but you become culturally, socially female or gendered uh, through your experiences from the almost from conception really it's a very interesting point so my overall conclusion here is so black is not an objective condition to be black is a is a social construct again this is a critical position it links in very nicely with the theses so where does that leave us okay i think we can make the following points reasonably convincingly that historical objectivity is something that we can aspire to, but we must take care not to accept the world, uh, historical realism, on face value. Objectivity means what then? 
could mean seeking to not misrepresent the evidence, thinking of David Irving, but also open to alternatives. It could go this way, it could go this way. Barbara Tuckman, finding new ways to approach the evidence. Okay, that's, you know, Kleinberg and Co. Objectivity also means admitting when you don't know or unsure. That's Tuckman again, isn't it? But being brave enough to attempt an interpretation. Barbara Tuckman, you know, took on a massive task of trying to capture and say something meaningfully historical about the 14th century. Objectivity is also humble and willing to incorporate critique as Kleinberg and Co. lay out. Okay. Objectivity itself has a history. That's really important too. Objectivity means challenging old repressive representations like blackness and whiteness and so on, as Mina Salami argues. So that there's some points that we can make. But I want to finish by turning to Cynthia Dillard, who I've got it here somewhere. Hmm. I'm not sure where it went. I had it here just, you know, a little while ago. She wrote a great book on reimagining um, identity. And I will have to make sure that before I put up this um, PowerPoint that I, uh, let's see there, there it is, um, that I uh, put the uh, details. And hers is that basically it's an education book or it's an, a book on educational research. It's learning, so learning is the first word, to remember the things we've learned to forget. And the subtitle is In Darkened Feminism, Spirituality and the Sacred Nature of Research and Teaching. The Sacred Nature of Research and Teaching. All right. So I just, I'm going to finish with this paragraph here or section from Dillard's um, where she's talking about an experience she had at a conference where, you know, somebody in the audience uh, challenged her over a over what makes for good research, you know, and it's, uh, it's about objectivity, which, of course, is I'm using this quote with a very, you know, specific reason. This is a message for you. So Dillard question at this conference was about scientific objectivity as a methodolo methodological goal of good science. Okay, it's a methodological goal of good science. In other words, it's not theoretical. It's something that uh, science is the theoretical, objectivist, positivist um, context in which good research can occur. It was clearly not arising from an African feminist position of consciousness, she says, where one raises questions to put under scrutiny and possible to get rid of them, erase them, the troubling notions of whose stories get told, when, where, and how. It's really important. But what is most troubling for Dillard is that what seemed good in research is still a question that persists, continuing to marginalise women's voices, that the good doesn't allow for not just feminists, perspectives but for women's voices themselves what i'm suggesting here she goes on or concludes is that in order to remember we must use and this is really important i think she stretches the uh the research base like me and our whole bodies minds and spirits as tools and sites and i think sites are really important it's what, actually, I'll lean over here and grab this book. This is called Oops, Song Lines. Tony's probably been all over this already. I'm not sure if you have, Tony. But, you know, first knowledges. And uh, Margot Neal, who's the Indigenous writer for uh, in this book, there's Margot Neal and Lynn Kelly, who's the um, non-Indigenous writer. But Margot Neal talks about the third archive, which is essentially whole bodies, minds and spirits and tools and sites. That one there is uh could have made a quote from that but anyway I, i'm going to go back and restate that final sentence what i'm suggesting here is that in order to remember we must use our whole bodies our mind and our spirit as tools and sites to ask new questions of the goodness of science of our multiple histories not one but multiple histories and finally of theory <coughs> I think Cynthia Dillard, wonderful scholar, wonderful thinker, um, who 
really puts herself on the line. She's a, uh, an African-American woman. Uh, she has uh, been to Africa, visited sites of, you know, um, of great violence in, this, in the slave trade and so on. She writes and reflects about that, but she also goes back to visit the people that she is descended from. She writes all about all of that in that little book. It's just beautiful. Uh, you can also find articles by her online. I'm not sure if that book's in the library. But anyway, I'm going to stop there because I'm starting to ramble, aren't I? And I apologise for that. Yeah, I'm going to stop. Um, I'll leave you to enjoy your, uh, your week four, enjoy the readings, and uh, I will be dropping you another line sometime next week when I get around to making one another thought bubble for you. Okay, bye-bye. See you then.